So welcome, welcome back from lunch. Um, and I got to meet y'all earlier. My name's Steven, so I'm not gonna talk as much about what I do because you just heard it. I'd like to hear these guys talk a little bit more, but um, I introduce you to Jason Leith. Jason's an alumni from Biola, right? That's right. Mm -hmm. Did some classes in this place right here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, he's gonna share with us some, some fascinating stuff that uh, inspires me greatly. And uh, to my right here, your left, is Roy Cochran. Roy has become a, a very close friend and a mentor to to both Jason and I throughout the years and lives down in Carlsbad. You've been a worship leader, worship pastor. Well, you've got a paycheck for being a worship yeah. pastor for yeah. like 20, 25 uh, years, yeah. something like that. Um, and uh, you've born and raised here, right? Yep. In Southern yep. California. Southern California. Um, so I, we were discussing like, what should this workshop be about? And I was like, man, I really want to invite Roy's to be a voice into this and help guide us through some of the conversations and keep us on track but add some of his own thoughts because he he knows our hearts and he knows our our crafts and uh he always uh he says the definition of being a mentor is mining the gold out of people and he's definitely mined gold out of both of us uh, through the years and uh I, I i'm not just saying this but like i feel like i am who i am today and i would say jason would say the same because of Roy and because of people like Roy who's just constantly encouraged us and said you aren't crazy or you are crazy and so am I <laughs> we're all crazy let's be crazy together and do crazy stuff so Roy thank you for uh, yeah, for for, me for joining us um, so like I said like I've already spent a lot of time speaking to you guys and, and sharing you um, the media side and the projection and the digital side of of what it means to curate sacred space, but I wanted to pass it to uh, Jason and let him share from his perspective in the world of physical art and, and curating spaces. So Jason, yeah, take it away. Yeah, I'd love to start by sharing a little bit of um, kind of where my basis of thought of all this comes from and kind of where I begin thinking as an artist. Um, it's our desire to put our ideas and our feelings and our thoughts into physical things, uh, whether it's music or a piece of poetry or a space, whatever it is, we're, as artists, we're putting ideas that are not physical into physicality. And it comes in so many different forms. But just the act of that itself is, um, it's incarnational. It's something where you're bringing something out of nothing into somethingness. And just that alone mm. is sacred. Mm. And so we have to start there by knowing that just the act of making something come into physical presence is sacred, is divine, because that's who Christ is. Uh, Christ did that 2,000 years ago, and his incarnation from uh, into physicality, into humanness, was sacred, and so kind of as artists, we're we're taking that as uh, as food and inspiration and encouragement for our craft, because mm. that's what we do all the time. Um, when I just interject here, one of the reasons I'm such big fans of both these guys is um, if you've been serving any length of time in the church, um, our bandwidth for what we and the tools we have to communicate good news and to facilitate an encounter with God in worship, I would say have been in a very narrow bandwidth. You know, and, and it's been music primarily with visuals to support a music message. Um, it hasn't always been that way. It's been that way just recently, you know, like the last 30, 40 years, 50 years, 100 years, whatever. But um, why this discussion is important for you and why this is important for the church is is people like Jason and and Stephen are facilitating a conversation that we can all join in that that widen the bandwidth of expression and encounter that makes sense cuz sometimes it's not everybody encounters with just music so my wife needs to get out in in nature that's her primary way of connecting with god and what these two and what i believe many in, in the room here are doing 
is there's a stirring in you to think, man, there must be a wider, there must be more ways to communicate what's stirring in me, and there must be a better way to, and a wider way to communicate to the people I'm called to serve. Because quite frankly, I think many people are bored. They know and they expect every, they can tell you, if you ask people at church, what's gonna happen Sunday, most of your congregation would probably give you a pretty good idea of your liturgy. And I think what artists can do is help bring back the awe and wonder that was going on there. And so um, what I've seen in these two lives here, and why this, this is an important discussion to jump in on, is um, it's like, it's like if you can only record with two tracks, you have to, you, you've got to, you're limited and you got to be, but it also create, creates a creativity. When all of a sudden multi-track recording came in, there was all kinds of new possibilities. What they're talking about is adding to the, the communication style of just music and audio, a whole new sound, not just visuals, but, but an encounter environmentally. Yeah. So all five senses. Yeah, so that's, I, I kind of, Jason wouldn't probably go into all that, he just does it instinctively. And so, um, anyways, I went, I went, Yeah. maybe even an introduction for those who don't know where you serve now and, yeah. and things like that, tell a little bit yeah. of your story. Um, long story short. Thank you. Thanks, Dane. Yep. Um, Dane Sanders, everyone. <laughs> Just trying to get on cake. <laughs> <laughs> nice. It's like Good water bottles. For <laughs> um, long story short, my passion lies between art and people. So however those two things come in, come in contact, whether it's community building or relationship sparking uh, through the vehicle of art, that's where I start to get passionate and fired up. And it's look you know, so many different ways of doing that. And uh, in the last three years, I've been working at Saddleback Church as their arts initiative director, which is basically uh, art as ministry and community building. And then um, also on the side, I'm running this thing called Sacred Streets, and it's basically an initiative to uh, be in relationship with uh, the marginalized, specifically the homeless, um, through art, and to give them a gift of beauty and to know them uh, at the depths of who they are and to give them a little piece of dignity and beauty uh, through art. And so, I mean, I've been uh, kind of riding this wave of this big show that I did a couple years ago on Skid Row and, you know, I'm ready to make something new, but I still get to talk about it, mm -hmm. uh, about kind of what happened there on Skid Row a couple years ago because um, God was totally in it and I'll show you a picture uh, of what we built, but the reason I brought this up is because this is kind of one of the artists who inspired me. Believe it or not, this is uh, an art piece. This is uh, inside of a warehouse. Anselm Kiefer is one of my favorite artists uh, because he not only makes he not only makes these pieces that go on the wall or on the floor, but he creates an entire environment to envelop the pieces. And the environment speak to the pieces as the speak, pieces speak back to the environment. And the person is enveloped in this place, in this space. And it's so powerful. And that's kind of what Stephen was doing for us not too long ago, was he was putting us in an entire environment of sound and light. And you could almost feel the textures that he was putting on onto the wall. And, um, and that's why I love him. Because sometimes visual art alone can be um, it's just, it needs, it needs something to pair with it. It pairs so well with music, it pairs so well mm -hmm. with poetry, and really brings more, to bring more of the senses out mm -hmm. in one expression is so powerful. And so that's why Anselm really inspired me. And uh, I just wanted to show you this because that's kind of, this is another one of his environments. You can't see the, I'm not showing you the pieces. The pieces are kind of small and inside these spaces, but I think um, when we're talking about sacred space, if you're a visual artist, if you're a musician, if you're a poet, it's hard to actually create an entire space, an entire place, a feeling, an environment with just your craft. So the collaboration and bringing all these elements together, I think is pretty important. And I love how Anselm Kiefer does that with his work. And so that inspired me to, oh, uh, there's James Terrell. Do we know James Terrell? Awesome, awesome stuff. He works with architecture and light, and putting those two things together. And he's even done things in um, Quaker, 
prayer houses, how do you say, prayer, uh, what would you call it? Yeah, Quaker space for, of prayer and, and congregation. He's done work in even those spaces, which just shows kind of the nature of his work is very much suiting to bring the sacred. And uh, this is the gallery over at Saddleback Church. I'll probably talk about that in a little should we, bit. Should we put, take, taking off these lights? Should the, yeah. I wonder if we should sure, try it, try it out. See what happens. It's kind of a dark picture anyways, so I don't know if it's going to help too much. Up to you. There's Sister Shannon. So some of my illustrations will come from this, which this is kind of the, this is what Sacred Streets looked like on Skid Row um, in 2013, summer of 2013. And this was a structure that was built out of all reclaimed materials um, off, found off the streets of Skid Row and uh, built into a space that um, took direct instruction from Revelation 21, which talks about the New Jerusalem. So the, uh, how there's entrances on every side, how it's equal in length and width and height, how it has 12 foundations, even the light. Um, everything about this space was uh, kind of a miniature version of what we read about in Revelation 21, and that sacred space being described, which is basically heaven. <laughs> it's the new earth, but it describes this space, which has a specific length, a specific height, specific uh, materials and colors. And, and it's basically um, another version of what we see in the tabernacle in the Old Testament um, that Bezalel was commissioned to build. Bezalel, Bezalel was commissioned to build uh, this space where people would meet God uh, before Christ came. And, and the New Jerusalem looks very, it sounds very similar to this tabernacle space. So this is a, like all, almost a tabernacle as well. And um, so I want to just use, just show you guys this. So as I, this is kind of part of my experience, this is how I've worked out sacred space in my artistic practice. And so this is kind of what I'm, I'll sometimes use illustration from. And um, basically I think without getting uh, too far into it yet, uh, the big idea of this is that the sacred could be found in anything. Any object, any space, any place, and especially in us as Christians, the sacred, the divine, comes through, it permeates through physicality at certain moments, right? There's certain moments where it really begins to come through and jump out at you and you begin to realize God again. Oh yeah. God is in the streets of Skid Row. Oh yeah, I can find God in a tree, a mountain, a landscape, and even like junk that I find off the floor. Sometimes I see a piece of beauty in that. And that's kind of what we're here to do as artists, is reawaken people to the God in everything. So can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. Regarding this as a visual artist, who told you you could do that? <laughs> I mean, where, where, where do you see that? Was yeah. there someone who inspired you to do that? Or at, at one of our arts gatherings, Jason was speaking a lot about how this, this development in his heart of, of developing his artistry, but also having the courage as a, as a son, you know, as our identity as the sons and daughters, as well as everything else, hearing that voice that to say, hey, I've got something that might mm. be a little bigger than you are. Oh yeah, way bigger than me. <laughs> you wanna but share really, a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, it came through actually years of trying to work out what does it look like to use, um, use art as a vehicle for a relationship. And uh, as, because the homeless were the people that I was most interested in creating a relationship with, I guess, it was my mission to try to work out with them how art could be a vehicle to be in a relationship with them. Mm. And, um, and so this is what came of it because after, after years of just working this out, I found out, oh, art gives dignity. Art gives people a gift that's not just um, practical, it's not just like utilitarian, but it gives mm. something to the soul. It gives you a gift there. And so as I was thinking about doing this show, 
it was very much about giving the homeless a gift of beauty. And it was for them. It wasn't for the audience, really. Mm -hmm. I wanted them to maybe see something in it, too. But I wanted the artwork to be a gift for them. And so when I was thinking about presenting it and, and actually displaying the work for them, I'm like, I could either do this in a gallery space that's two blocks up from Skid Row, because that's where the art walk is. Or I could bring the work down to them. Mm -hmm. That sounds like more of a better option. How do I do that? What do I want that space to look like? Do I want it to be on the walls? Do I want it to be along the sidewalk outside? Or like, and so it kind of started with, I'll build like kind of like a little shack or like a little tent where they can like come in and see the art. And I pictured it like, I pictured it like this big, like just, just big enough to walk into hmm. and just big enough to like see the art on the walls and like look around and be like, oh, that was cool. And kind of having it mimic like a space that a homeless person would be staying in. But I was like, the one thing that I want this space to do is I want it to be restful and rejuvenating for the people that walk into it. I want it to kind of restore. And so where do we find that? Revelation 21. It's all about healing. It's all about rejuvenation and restoration and rest. And so really the reason why I, why I went to uh, using that scripture passage uh, for this space is because of what it is by, by nature. Mm -hmm. And uh, it turned out to be, I actually followed <laughs> exactly what it said to do word by word, except use the elements that uh, that audience really knew and had an intimate relationship mm -hmm. with. Mm -hmm. um, and I, so I found that sacred space is composed of, it needs to be rejuvenating. I think what Stephen did for us uh, in the last session with his um, visual liturgy that was restful, that was rejuvenating, and it was sacred. It was a sacred space that I felt like I was in. I don't know about you guys, but that was restful and rejuvenating for me. Um, and I think that is an element of sacredness. But also, with this, the I'm talking for too long, it's time to let you guys really talk good. for a little it's bit. really good, keep no, talking. But, um, <laughs> it's not just about, there's not a particular, um, there is a particular set of components that can bring sacredness, but you need to be aware of your audience. You need to be aware of the place you're in, the place in time, the people you're speaking to, um, the culture, and it's gonna, sacred space is gonna look different for different people. So places of worship have looked different throughout all of time. Um, for the Egyptians, it looked different than it looked for the Greeks, than it looked for us. And it looks different 50 years ago in our churches than it looks today. And so when you're bringing, when I'm trying to bring a space of sacredness to the homeless on Skid Row, what they're gonna relate most to and see the most depth in is the stuff that they build their houses out of and the stuff that they're familiar with and the stuff that they sell. And that was really special to them. Mm -hmm. And so there's an element of, for an artist, if you're gonna do your craft well, of listening and responding, not if you're gonna give a good gift, I think you need to be receiving from the culture first mm. and then give it back as you're, after you've listened for a little bit. Mm. Good. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye. Yeah. <laughs> that was incredible. You know, um, to borrow again from Jeremy, you know, <clears throat> about, about with artists, many times it's, we wrestle with, is it about being seen or, or, yeah. Having new eyes to see. What? How? How did he put it? That's it. Yeah. yeah. Being seen, or developing new eyes to see. Um, I could tell you what happened if you were part of this journey through this building. While he was listening to what his heart was saying, and and what he was listening to what the Lord was saying to him, and he was listening to who his audience was, everybody who came through here was able to also have their world enlarged because there's no way they would go through Skid Row, one. And they many times we could look at people who are marginalized in that way and we see them or we don't see them, whatever, wherever our heart's at. And the Lord, I think, was trying to say something here by saying, I want you to look at this. Jesus, many times when he was teaching, would say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have this parable but only people who have ears to hear are gonna hear this. Only people who have eyes to see are gonna see this. And I believe the beauty of an artist is that we can bring into focus some things of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. And what was happening here at this at the sacred space, there was dignity given to these people, but all the whole gallery was 
made of what we would consider trash. And in our society, in our culture, our culture, without being PC, would view homeless people as the same material. We walk past it, we don't want to deal with it, we want to contain it. And what God did through Jason is he invited culture into a space where we could see these human beings, these men and women, these sons and daughters differently. Mm. Art is powerful. And the space in which we can transform is, is in, can really give us new eyes to see and new ears to hear what, what's going on in the kingdom. Mm. Right? Yeah. I'd love to hear from Stephen yeah. even with that um, idea of it looking different for different people how your craft has perhaps changed for different churches, different times, different yeah. spaces, and, and why you've decided to make those decisions. Yeah, gosh, yeah. Um, I just piggyback off of what Roy said. Yeah, I mean, I feel like I love the phrase being able to see the unseen. And when you have eyes to see, you see the unseen. You see Jesus. And, you, and Jesus says, whatever you do to the least of these, you do unto me. And I just see that so boldly and beautifully done through this project and, you know, being able to see the marginalized and see the unseen and, and just go and saying, like, I see you, you matter, and I'm going to sacrifice and pour all this energy into saying, like, you are loved and you are valued. Um, and then in what you were talking, I was thinking, like, so you, that, that sounds great. I mean, it is beautiful, but that also lasted for a temporary amount of time. And you spend most of your time at one of the largest, best mega churches in <laughs> Southern California in Orange County. Mm -hmm. It's almost like the extreme opposite going from Skid Row to, or, to the OC and doing the same thing. You don't call it the OC. <laughs> Sorry. People if you're from, from Nashville. In Nashville, do they call it the OC? Yes. Well, in that, <laughs> and y'all probably think we all go to Tootsie's right, right. Lounge and go, go get discovered at the Bluebird Cafe, don't you? Because you watch the show Nashville and that's how it happens. So. <laughs> Sorry, my roommate, my roommate just has these times like Wednesday nights. He's like, hey, I want to have some friends over. We're going to watch the OC. And I'm like, I've never seen that, but okay. And I watched like a couple of episodes and I'm like, this is bizarre. <laughs> is that what it's really like here? Totally. Anyways, for it's totally, people, it's it for is. some people. <laughs> Good Lord. Anyways, foreigner. Um, so, <laughs> uh, tangents, Good. squirrel. Good. Good. Um, <laughs> anyways, uh, getting back to seriousness. Uh, <laughs> how, like going from that to places like that and to like a church setting where people just could take art for granted, they take Jesus for granted, they take Christianity and freedom or, you know, we all struggle with different things. And, and I've spent a lot of time in the church culture, so I'm still kind of licking my wounds a little bit, just like almost feeling like I can almost feel anesthetized a little bit um, and numb to what's happening. So that's one of the things that I, I mean, I'm just being vulnerable here. That's one of the things that I struggle with as an artist is going into, I wish I had some beautiful blueprint or answer to give you like, here's how to do this at your church and it always work. Um, it's usually just me trying to wake up my own senses and, and become alive and, and to see and, um, because it's so easy to get lost in the noise and get, here's the normal like you said it's like if you'd say what, what's sunday going to be like you could well we're going to do this 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 uh, we're going to sing those songs all the set lists seem to be the same type of songs and they're great songs i'm just kind of tired of singing the same songs over and over again um and i i have definitely come through a season of burnout and just being so overexposed to church culture and conference culture and being an industry around, being in Nashville where it's your job to be a professional Christian artist, which I loved what Dane and Jeff yeah. were talking about. And I was like, yes, I love what he's saying here about, I don't like the phrase the Christian artist. Um, I'm in a town that has made a business out of being Christian artists. And, um, and it's definitely taken a toll on me. And, and I, can, I can so easily show up in a, a church setting and trying to bring all this 
beauty and art and imagery and awaken the imagination and it can just be so rote for me or burn out because it's like here we're just showing up and doing the same thing and people are just ready to they're wondering what's for dinner and when we can go to lunch and you know it's hard um it's like I, I love it and I hate it and I'm just being I didn't even plan on sharing all this I'm just opening up and it's just coming out but um so I you know on good days when I'm like really trying to prepare and think like what what could I bring as an artist and offer uh, to these people? Like, it plays out two different ways in in my world. One would be traveling to different conferences, kind of like kind of like this, but this one's very unique. It's awesome, but um, you know where there's a concert that's happening, there's a set list, and you just have to pick songs that go to the music. And I've had to almost like I made a job out of being a chameleon. And just saying, like, I'm just going to, like, conform to what you're doing. Um, and you're playing rock, so I'm going to do rocky, cool visuals, you know, like rock and roll. Or if you're doing this kind of vibe over here, so i got to figure out visuals that match that vibe. Um, and after a while, I mean, I, I kind of took pride in it, the fact that I could just, no matter what your genre is, I can get in there and I've got graphics for that, you know. and just kind of like made a business out of that um, until all of a sudden I was just like, why do I, I believe in visual worship and I believe in the church and art and beauty in these conversations, but why do I hate in my life right now? Like not hate my life, that's strong words, but like, I'm just so bored. I became bored. Um, and like, I would have people like Roy and different ones who would just, bring a lot of just wisdom and comfort and encouragement in my life and one guy was just like you're tired of being a chameleon aren't you I'm like oh yes I'm just tired of just serving what the person on stage wants not that I'm opposed to that but it's like there was no collaboration I was just background and that's the word that is circulates in church media world so much that I hate is the word backgrounds. Mm. It's like, what are those backgrounds? Like, <laughs> that's a cool background. Where'd you get that? You know, <laughs> that person's face is a great background. Like, it's like, <laughs> well, it makes no sense. But we, that's how we talk about art and beauty visually. We've gone from icons and stories told in stained glass and cathedrals that would take, you know, sometimes centuries to build. Um, that these spaces that were curated to declare the story of God and to to tell the story of the community. So much of the stained glass is exactly what you're doing here with, in Skid Row is, is uh, telling the story of the community and of the nation and, and what happened uh, throughout history. And anyways, um, you know, it's just, it's relegated to eye candy and backgrounds and we want just a really cool effect. Oh, and oh man, I, I saw this presentation by this one guy who's from, the OC, named Seth Bartlett. Does anyone know Seth? He's an incredible experience designer. And um, we actually have created, uh, a bunch of us have created um, and helped a visual worship conference in uh, October that's in Nashville called SALT. And Seth came out to SALT and did this amazing opening piece talking about the story of art and imagery in the, in the church and where we're at today. And there was a phrase in there that I'll never forget. He said, we, want, we traded excellence for easy. I mean, you could have heard, heard a pin drop in that place. Because like nowadays in this, just this fast food, instant gratification, want it now, Sunday's coming, Easter's coming, we gotta come up with a huge big production, wow. big wow. Now, now, now. You know, I heard another day a friend reached out to me and he said, hey, my pastor learned about environmental projection. He, he wants it for Easter. What do I do? Because I don't know about any of this stuff, but he wants it. And I'm just like, if I were speaking to him, like, I would say, this is a great conversation to have, but maybe not this Easter. Let's try something small and then let's build towards it. Because it's this, it's this craft, right, that you want to work on and refine. And but we just want it easy and we want it fast. We want to know how to do it really quickly. And where do we find those backgrounds? 
Mm. And I'm just mm. like, man, I just feel like we're selling ourselves short. Mm. It is really interesting because artwork can take those two different forms so easily where the line of between entertainment and intimacy can be crossed so quickly uh, because sacred space and bringing, bringing the divine into our spaces should be an intimate thing, not mm. an entertaining thing. And I think what you did with switching it up for us and helping us to just, oh, I'm not used to like just sitting and listening. That's something that's out of my norm. Um, I know what to do when I worship. This is what I do. And, I, and so easily that can cross that line and you can get into the mode. But when we bring people out of their, their regular habits, habitual Sundays, or whatever it is, whatever space we're trying to create as an artist, you bring, I think that's what art is about, is bringing people out of their habits, their, what they know and what they recognize and bringing something in front of them that they don't recognize and that they have to engage with. Their mind, ha their gears start to have to work. Like, oh, how do I compute this? How do I relate to this? How do, mm. you know, what does this mean for me? And start to ask questions. That's when I think intimacy and individuality begin mm. to, uh, that's where art should be triggering is, is individuality and how do, how do I respond to this? And I think, especially with people who are in larger churches or speaking to larger audiences, um, that's such a powerful, art is such a powerful tool in that way to bring indiv individuality. And uh, expect, you know, what it, however it looks, whether it's in our music or in an art gallery, it's really great. I think, you know, the worship center at Saddleback is huge. The, and this is our art gallery. Um, the, the space is just jimungus. It's like a big Costco inside. <laughs> and it's like, oh, cool. Like, and so like your idea of God is like, he's, he's big. Like, he's beyond. He's, wow, like, it's kind of, it's reverence, but it's not quite intimacy in that worship center. And so it reinforces the idea that God is far off. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't always have us. to be far off, but it's definitely grand. It's definitely like, Scales, I worship you because you are high, you are mighty, mm -hmm. you are powerful. I am little me, and it's, it's humbling. Um, of course, you can kind of get into other postures, but like you were saying, our spaces, they form us in our community. You, we build our spaces, then our spaces form us. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of what the space says by nature. And so to bring art into that community, it's, it's really kind of balancing that out of like, this is a more intimate space it's we care about everything that's going on the walls we it's you know the ceilings are lower um and when we do like interactive art pieces outside where everyone can be involved that's bringing in an element where people feel like individuals again well i want to jump on that real fast mm -hmm. yeah. um not to cut you off but For sure interactive the word interactive mm -hmm. and uh yeah a friend of mine actually guy that um i think you should know about named mark pearson from New Zealand wrote a book called The Art of Curating Worship, Reshaping the Role of Worship Leader. One of my favorite books of all time, um, and uh, I highly recommend it. So he said to me one time, he said, you know, the musician Brian Eno defines interactive as this, unfinished. Mm. And I loved that, and, and I was thinking like, it's one thing to show up as like, you are the artist in the room, perform art for us, create an experience for us, which I love to do um, most days. Um, but what I have found really interesting and actually healing uh, is a kind of a different approach to art that my local church takes um, back in Nashville as we um, try as much as possible to make it Interactive, And it's a both and. I mean, uh, we're showing up, we set up some projectors, and there's a guy that run li runs lights, and you kind of create a vibe. And you can walk in the room and have, you don't have to do anything. You can just receive it. But we also create different stations um, uh, around the side and around the perimeters of the room. And sometimes we'll create entire worship services that revolve around interacting with different stations. Um, and these stations ask questions, they invite you to create um, 
to collaborate and create a big art piece together and you don't have to be an, an artist uh, to to contribute to it it's just a simple action that you can do in a piece of yarn that that represents a prayer or a confession or someone that you're praying for um, and it's kind of the metaphor that I go for is like it's it's one thing to be the artist to paint a picture and hang it on the wall for everyone to admire but what happens if you hang a blank canvas ask a question and hand the congregation the paintbrush then it gets really interesting then it becomes very that is like um, contextualization um, to the nth degree <laughs> because it is your community's expression and it's it's, it ties into what you were just saying. Like, then it starts this conversation. You're, it's inviting them, and you're basically creating this unfinished piece of piece of artwork, mm -hmm. and inviting them to pray through that art. Yes, How Barry, about you have a question. Actually, in the service, could you describe the service where people were interacting? I mean, mm -hmm. was it at the end of the service or before, yeah. or, or just how, how did that work? Uh, we'll both go, but I'll. Um, it, we've done it a couple of different ways. One, sometimes we create an, uh, an entire worship service, or we'll put, and it may, it'll be like on a Tuesday night or a Good Friday experience or something like that, where we set an hour uh, aside. We play ambient music, um, darken the room up, have candles lit, and then there's just stations all throughout the room. You can sit in your seat, but you can get up and move at any point and it's kind of like people are filtering in and then at the end of that we'll have a time of sung worship and a teaching or whatever but on Sundays we might have one or two stations and then communion stations as well um, around the room and it's we do the bulk of our singing after the sermon so there's a lot of time for response so and reflection uh, so it's just during the songs people at any point at any point can get up and move and receive communion uh, but then there's some other stations um, on the side that they can interact with and sometimes on Sundays like there's just one station we don't try to do like this sometimes we have done elaborate and multiple stations that you move through but um, week after week it gets very tiring to do that and set it up all the time but usually we'll have just one station um, and it's just kind of while people are singing. And what you'll find is it's not like everyone moves to the station then. It's usually just a couple of people, and that's fine. Um, it's very invitational, nothing is forced. Mm -hmm. um, whenever we do interactive art pieces, it's mainly after the service. It's more of like a response. It's, a, it's an action step, it's, a, and it's an afterward. Um, and again, talking in terms of listening to your place, listening to your people and your culture and responding as an artist. Um, this is an element that I've seen as really important in our culture um, as everything is getting smaller, more individual, customer relationship management is a word in business now where it's like there needs to be a relationship. It's not just, they're not just your customer, you're not just marketing something to them, mm. but they're actually a participant um, that's, I think, an element that I've seen, and it, it comes out naturally in me because I am part of the culture, so I do want it to be individual, I do want it to be small, I do want it to be intimate, but uh, that should bleed into all our expressions, and it can look so many different ways, but one of the ways that we do it at Saddleback is we do interactive art pieces where people, after the service, they can come and actually be a part of making the artwork. and. Uh, I can give you a card afterwards that shows you 20 different projects that we've done over the last three years of what these different things could look like. But the element that we really care about is that people feel like they're a part. They're no longer consuming, but they're, they're an individual and they're part of it. They have a voice. They are, an, they're, they are an individual loved by God who has a place, a specific place for them in the church and they are part of a larger fabric, but they're, they matter in that fabric. So we're about, to, um, this is my friend Stephen Homestead up here in the front corner, and uh, the thir for the 35th anniversary of Saddleback Church at, on the 21st of this month, uh, we're going to be gathering in Angel Stadium, 40,000 people. 
How intimate is that? Um, it's awesome, it's big, it's grand, it's exciting, it's a celebration. But what our element, we're actually gonna do a collective tapestry where everyone is gonna get to put a piece of fabric into the tapestry to represent the unity of the body of the church and celebrating together, but you know, mm -hmm. their piece, their fabric mm -hmm. in, that, in the midst of that tapest tapestry represents them as an individual who has importance in that body. So the picture of the body of the church of like, yeah, the eye is a small thing or the pinky is a small thing, but if you lose it, you're gonna be, you're gonna be sad, you're gonna be missing something. Mm -hmm. And every interactive art piece that we do, that's kind of the theme that comes forward. It's like, oh, what does this one mean? It's kind of like an illustration of the body of the church and like everyone coming together in their individuality. That's happened like five times. <laughs> That's been the description. We just find a different verse to recognize that. But. Stephen, um, I'm going to address this to you. You work with a number of different artists. I mean, one weekend you might be with Beth Moore, and then the next weekend you could be with The Brilliance or with you know Gunger or somebody like that. In preparing to... Um, how would you describe your role, what they're looking for you to do, one? And how do, is your preparation different based on who you're serving? Um, wow. I don't know if I've ever been asked that question, so I'm gonna just try to That's process great. that a little bit. <laughs> um, if you don't know, Beth Moore's a uh, Bible study teacher, uh, mostly in the Baptist world. Um, incredible um, expository teachings and all kinds, I mean, she's like the, the, the Bible teacher of all Bible teachers. It's incredible, um, her theology and just the, her ability to teach on a very relational level on a large scale. Um, uh, then you have, you know, guys like Michael Gunger <laughs> and his brother who like are great friends of mine and if you follow them on Twitter, and if you follow Michael on Twitter, <laughs> I would say that. Um, if you're Michael, if you're listening to this, I love you. Uh, he loves to challenge different thoughts that the, the modern day church has held on to. And I love the questions that he asks. And I even think a lot, a lot how he thinks, you know, like not agreeing with a uh, seven day literal creation or the flood was more of a mythical story that we learned something about ourselves and God. It doesn't, it's not something that really happened. Um, I don't know what to think about all that, but I love those conversations. Um, and there's all these other things that he'll, he'll get into as well. So from, I would say for, there's, there's a difference between those two, meaning like the theological spectrum, both very much love and believe in Jesus but how the Bible is interpreted um, and how what Christian, Christianity looks like, there's kind of a broad spectrum there. Um, and, it's, and what's funny because we were at an event and Beth literally was like, when you see Michael and Lisa, you please tell them like how much I love them. I love their music and beautiful things mean so much to me and my family. And, it's so funny, like behind the scenes, it's like everyone's actually pretty close um, right. together and there's a lot of love and relationships. On a public scale, you see this like theological difference. And so you go into like, it might be a woman's conference that where there's a, a very conservative culture and then I'm going to a concert in a bar where like, um, you're Projecting crying out, God, sheet. God, where are you? And, and uh, we've got it all wrong and I'm projecting on guitars and sheets behind them and it's very different. So <clears throat> honestly, from a creative standpoint, like I feel like the art that I bring into a space is, um, I love the word illumination instead of illustration. And there's a difference between illustration and illumination. Uh, illustration is a, a literal representation of something that's happening. and. Everyone in the room, 90, I would say 90% of the people in the room would understand it and get it at first glance. It's just kind of obvious, right? Mm -hmm. An illumination is different. Illumination is much more subversive. Um, it's, it's deep with meaning, but the theological meaning in it and the questions and the things that you could get out of this art, it's almost like buried treasure. 
And you have to kind of work with it and sit with it for a while. And you may look at it a hundred times and then all of a sudden you notice something about it, something so subtle and you're like, oh, I never saw it that way before. Oh, wow. And not in a, is the dress black or gold or whatever the heck, whatever the color it is, blue and gold or white and whatever. Not in a, oh my gosh, it changed colors. But like, just things like, I never noticed that thing before. Um, and illumination, that, that whole idea comes from um, the, the ancient gospel books that were illuminated back in 600 to 800 uh, AD. Anyways, skewing. Um, I find that when I approach art in more, even though there's room for illustration, obviously, when I bring illuminations into a space and things aren't so obvious and at first glance, um, I can bring in that same image doesn't matter where I'm at. That cloud that's falling down from the sky, from the walls that you saw at the beginning, I've used, I've turned that into different colors and projected that all over the Gunger Band. And I've taken the same image and I've used it for Revelation Song that plays right before Beth gets up and speaks. Um, I've used Gunger songs to, to, uh, to, as a soundtrack for scripture before Beth gets up and teaches. Um, and then I'll take concepts and film footage uh, that was used to create a uh, Gunger's documentary, Let There Be, and I've used that in uh, the middle of a worship song or I've used that as an opening scripture piece to set up Beth's talk to illuminate, not illustrate, but illuminate what it is that she's about to talk. So I'm gonna like, kind of get your emotion and your soul focused then she's gonna come in and feed your intellect like no other. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I'm kind of like, I go from like crazy space to, to ex other extreme space, and I'm like getting away with using some of the same art, I just recontextualize it and repurpose it in different ways. The creative process is um, all over the place though. I mean, with, with, with Gunger, we can have, when he's working on an album and he's gonna tour it, We've had times where we've talked months in advance and I'm listening to demos and kind of getting to the headspace. For I Am Mountain, I went to New Zealand with my buddy and shot a bunch of footage that we ended up not using. <clears throat> but it inspired me a lot. And, I, and we ended up going a different direction where we projected onto the band. And, um, and it's like I've never spent so much intentionality um, and preparation time to work on something, to have everything shift at the very end. I throw away all the ideas, all the Evernote stuff uh, that I logged, all the, the here, this for this song, this this concept for this song. Um, and then, uh, sorry, I'm just kind of rambling here. I'll wrap it up. But um, during rehearsals where we're trying to figure out what the order of the songs are and everything is so like chaotic and this beauty is just getting thrown in all over the place and everyone's freaking out going, it's not gonna work. And they're like, You're not gonna, they're not gonna see the projection and there's lights everywhere. And I'm like, that's because like, let's create projection moments instead of projection all the time. And then the lighting guy turned it all off. It was like literally like I was so depressed about the whole thing. And then I show up at the last day of rehearsal, kind of midway through the rehearsal, and they're like freaking out, excited, like, we got, dude, we got it, we figured it out. We turned the lights off and we, we did it. We were like, let's just, we almost scrapped all the projectors, but we were like, let's give it one last go. Let's turn the lights off and actually see what it is that Steven had created and see what it looks like. And they were like, oh my gosh, we get it now. We understand what you're trying to do. And then they were able to, pull the tour together, uh, at least on that aspect of it, and refine it along the way. Um, so that's like, things can be all over the place. Uh, and it's, it's fun, it's stressful, it's fly by the seat of your pants, uh, and, and it's some of the most thrilling experiences I've had as an mm -hmm. artist collaborating with music, because I have such a love for music. Mm -hmm. To me, the magic happens when the visual and the music and the moment all just kind of locks in and fuses right. together uh, in a very like jazz improv improvisational way. With uh, with Beth, I usually get a 
for a conference, for the women's conferences, we always create a unique two minute video to set her talk up. I'll get an email from her on Tuesday or Wednesday before the Friday night start time. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, she basically says like, here's the topic that I'm gonna teach on, here's the scripture verse, um, here's the direction and here's what I wanna call the event. And then she might throw out uh, certain types of images that might work as a good metaphor. Sometimes she'll get specific and like, I wanna see this type of image show up at the end here, try to work that in. And sometimes she just says, you know what, here's the scripture, pick your favorite translation of the Bible and I just, and just go for it. And I'm so sorry that I can't give you more direction. And it, there's such a freedom like, in yes. it. And I'm just like, uh, and there's such a freedom in it. And she doesn't micromanage. I don't have to get approval. Um, it, when she sees it on Friday, if she has time to sit down like after sound check and she wants to see it, it's not a see it because she needs to approve it. It's a see it because I'm so excited to share it with her and she's so excited to see it. And we're just, we're all excited, you know, like because it's just, there's this energy that happens. And I don't hear about that in a lot of churches. Mm -hmm. And I just hear approval and control and micromanaging and you have to have it turned in by this whatever. And we, they, they cast vision and they go, well, we didn't really want that, you know? And then thus begins the beginning process of artists burning out in the church. Hmm. And for me, it's just like, it's a huge responsibility and privilege to have like an arena full of, you know, 10,000 or 40,000 or whatever, you know, people. It's a huge responsibility and trust is huge in that situation. Um, so anyways, yeah, that's kind of, yeah. And uh, in our final moments here, Jason, you have anything you want to throw in here before we close up? Well, a question? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it seems like preparation is so important and having a certain amount of time. So in a local church situation, would it often work better if, if you had like a theme for three or four weeks that you could prepare for and so... Do you follow what I'm saying? Rather than each Sunday having to come up with something. Yeah, um, I mean, I, th I, I think coming, having to come up with something every single Sunday would be a little tiring. Uh, all I think like, I think having a couple of weeks and saying this is the direction that we're going and then creating a piece, if it's a video that's playing or graphics that will be projected on the wall or art that's being curated, that actually might take more time to commission artists or to gather the material up. Um, because the labor, I mean, like the labor of that physically is intense where I'm just sitting on my laptop thinking on the, you know, the keyboards and the mouse track with earbuds in. It's like I'm not <laughs> working out doing this thing. Um, but, uh, you know, there's different, it does take time to do it. So, I mean, my suggestion would be give, give artists time to create and understand their world and understand that they're not nine to five people and that punch a clock all the time and sit in a cubicle and are very efficient and log hours of how they're doing this. Like we procrastinate, we stay up late. We, <laughs> we, we, we said we needed three months and it's the week before and we still don't know what we're gonna do and we freak out. And, uh, and then in the, the 11th hour, it dawns on us and something happens and people are like, oh my gosh, that was amazing. And I'm like, <sighs> I, woo, that was good. you know. I think one of the things that Stephen was talking about, the difference between illumination and illustration is, is a huge thing. Um, as a worship leader, I would put that into illustration most of the time. We play the song, some of us are, are playing with tracks. Um, there's, you know, karaoke, the word, this is where you stand, this is where you sing. We're, we're pretty mad. There's not a lot of mystery, except for when God's presence kind of invades that, right? But the beauty and the importance of digital media coming into our sacred spaces is that it, it comes into that illumination thing where an image can be received in a myriad of different ways without definition. Uh, you could be playing the same worship song, and one week you could be having 
the classic worship hands, you know, kind of thing, you know, <laughs> the candles and whatever that slide is, background, sorry. Um, uh, but but uh, another one, you could play the same song and you could have images from Skid Row. Mm -hmm. and, and now worship takes on a completely different contextualization and you've now just widened the vocabulary mm -hmm. of what it means to worship for your community. Mm -hmm. And so the importance of digital media, I would say, is, is the, here's a couple of pioneers here, and, and way beyond you know, how we're going to end here, you should be in contact with these guys and, and um, let them continue to speak into your life. Yeah, it's interesting, I mean, because you have, I'm not a digital guy. I'm like, yeah, I don't, I don't use digital in my work. But when we're talking about the digitization of the Christian imagination, it's important to embrace that fully because it's always going to be refreshing if you're using it well, because it's refreshing itself at mm. a rate higher than we can catch up to. Mm. So we can continue to be so innovative and so refreshing to our audience through technology, but also continuing to work on the other side of the spectrum and continuing to be refreshing uh, from an old way of doing things. Mm -hmm. And that's why people are using Edison light bulbs and yeah. old yeah. reclaimed wood, you know. They're, they're playing that note too many times, but how can you continue to play the note in a refreshing way? Right. Where you're using, where you're not getting into technology and you are using um, <clears throat> these materials that are archaic uh, to be able to say the message in a way um, that we're not used to anymore. Well, yeah, you're interacting. You're, now you're interacting with the piece. And something that you do, Roy, I mean, when we're talking about sacred space, we're talking so much about space. Um, but the last thing I wanted to make sure we mention is that Roy helps to um, direct The Grove, which is basically pastors, artists here in Orange County and uh, uh, in San Diego and all the way up to L.A. And um, we gather in a home every month. Uh, we're going to do that on Monday where we gather in a home uh, of an artist and we eat and we hear music and we hear a speaker and we pray together and every time that space becomes a sacred space mm -hmm. becomes a worshipful space and it's really interesting the difference between where we are now and where we were when I was talking about Bezalel and the tabernacle because they had to build a space to meet God um, that was where they went to meet God they had to build this specific dimension specific height um, go into the Holy of Holies through a priest, whatever it was. Um, but today in the New Covenant, it's no longer space and another person. Uh, a hu another, yeah, space doesn't dictate God coming through and permeating into our presence. It's not through um, a physical uh, animal sacrifice. It's God is in us. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm trying to say is God is in every based. single, yeah, he's in every single one of us who have the Holy Spirit. But like you were saying, our spaces, um, they form our posture and we build our spaces and then they build us. Mm -hmm. So yes, space has become, it's like in a way less important, but also still so, so important, important. because it forms us who carry God. We carry, we carry that sacredness and that divinity in us. Mm -hmm. And I think the intimacy of, of Tom's home brings an intimacy of God because God is in all of us. Mm -hmm. but however we form our spaces, we got to know that that's so important. It's still so important because it forms us in our posture, and we are the fragrance yes. of God. We are the light of God, and so that's going to kind of form how that light looks and how that fragrance smells, how strong it is, how big it is, how small it is, that kind of thing. Yeah, it's interesting, like, just thinking about, we were kind of discussing it beforehand, like, sacred space in the Old Testament versus sacred space in the New Testament, the New Covenant, I should say. And just thinking that, you know, there was all these dimensions and instructions and things like that, like God saying, this is how I want the temple prepared. And, and I think it's, I, I love that in one sense that because it shows you that God even cares about those things, that they're, that, mm -hmm. the, and he, I even would even venture to say that he wired us a certain way. And so he obviously understands how we are wired mm -hmm. and that those spaces and those colors, we didn't we get into color theory of all things and lighting and juxtaposition and uh, how a space is curated basically and, mm -hmm. and, and set apart helps you to approach a certain space and creates a certain posture. And he's like, I want you to have a certain posture when 
we're together and when you approach me. Um, and that has not changed. I think that carries along now where we go, I don't think it changes the fact that we're with God because God is now with us. That's what changes. God is now with us. We're not waiting for the cloud to come down and consume the tent and the tabernacle and God's presence is dwelling in the Ark of the Covenant where he is location based. And so wherever the Ark goes, that's where God is going. Jesus then came. That was one sense of an incarnation of his presence in at least a container uh, that he filled. Now he filled the incarnation of Jesus Christ and then sent his Holy Spirit. Now it's God with us. He's with us everywhere. So how are we creating spaces to approach him and to create a posture to be with him? And it's about posturing the body. Um, and that's why I love about, right now I'm obsessed with the Anglican church and all the liturgy and everything is because it's all about praying with your body. It's very uh, tactile and tangible and it creates certain postures uh, when receiving the sacraments and and uh but it's the difference knowing that like we're not asking god to come down here with us but that he's with us now but do we see it, and it go, again it goes back to yeah do jeremy cowart's quote you know <laughs> thanks dane <laughs> are we just trying to be are we trying to be seen or are we trying to learn to see and to have eyes to see and to become aware of his presence and to realize he's with us and he's not just in you and me, but he's in the people with Skid Row, he's at the people in our churches, he's at the people in the galleries and the movie theaters and, uh, and all the art we create creates a posture both physically in the space but a posture of the, of the mind and of the heart because of how we're engaging the imagination. So um, We can go into Dane. Q&A, Dan, Dane? Yeah, so, Dane, Dane. Uh, um, <laughs> So, um, I had an experience a number of years ago in Anglican Church where um, I found spiritual experience out of the liturgy, um, and I ran into someone uh, afterward who was a regular there, I was not a regular there, and was expressing my experience, sharing my experience, and her response back to me was, I think that had more to do with you than it did with the liturgy. Mm. And there's something in that kind of, kind of it stuck with me for years, um, but it came to mind again as you were sharing that notion of you know, creating these sacred spaces, creating these environments. For the creator of the environment, that can be very meaningful. Mm -hmm. You are creating, you're active, like it's, there's super, there's a lot of ingredients here. There's intention, there's excellence, there's inspiration, there's hopefully God's spirit, like so many different pieces. But then for the participant, if they are involved to use their body, invited to use their body, or, respond or worship as response or whatever it is, it strikes me that they're really, it needs a confluence of all of these ingredients mm. for it to actually work. Mm. Like there's no magic sauce or like right. the poor light bulbs um, it, that we keep citing from, you know, the Braverman's backyard. Like that, <laughs> that, that um, there's, the reason those are so compelling is because it, it just, um, for, you know, the first time we experienced it, it was just awesome. Mm. But the, and it, it can stay awesome. Yeah. Uh, if you engage it with the same kind of intention and awake, and and, and I, if you could just comment a little bit about, um, the, it seems as though sometimes some of this exercise is really about how to come up with the next new thing, mm -hmm. as opposed to how do I prepare my heart to enter into an old thing or a new thing, mm -hmm. or or a, if I'm a have a tiny little church that doesn't have a lot of artistic talent in it, that yeah. somehow we can still create a sacred space. Mm -hmm. um, just comment a little bit on that. Not yet. <laughs> Don't look at me. <laughs> Especially with the whole like pursuit of it. It's great though. Like, it, it just seems yeah. like it to be a really easy temptation. It, yeah. I think we are obsessed with new and we're obsessed with originality in a sense. I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not about just copy and paste and don't contextualize and don't think about it, but I think there are a lot of uh, ancient treasures to recover and to dust them off and to go, mm -hmm. let's, let's use this practice. And that's what liturgy is full of that. Mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't mean that it has to become, liturgy gets a bad rap because it's just rote repetition or whatever. And sometimes I've, you know, it's like, well, don't blame the liturgy, blame the liturgist. Just like, hey, the, you know, uh, how great is our God is a great song. Uh, but if you all you've heard it done is led very poorly, you might think it's a bad song. Right. And it's like, don't blame the song. Blame the person leading it. Mm -hmm. um, and 
I don't know, it doesn't really address your question, but. Well, it, it does from the, from the point it, of like, there's a lot of there's a lot of stakeholders in these moments. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So God's the centerpiece. Yeah. And there's a leader, and then there's a participant, and then there's the artifact that's kind of you're manipulating to have a certain effect or experience happen or context. And in all of them, it seems like there's temptations to miss the big point. Mm -hmm. I, I really think it's the posture of the leader. Mm -hmm. Because we follow in, in how he's um, receiving the liturgy and how, what, you know, the tone of his voice and the, you know, how much he actually feels, feels like he means it. Like, let's enter into this, even if it's the same song after 10 weeks, you know, or if it's the same verse that we've all heard a million times. You know, a, a pastor can sell, tell the David and Goliath story um, in a way that I'm like, yeah, sweet, I've heard this before, check out. Or they can tell it again for the 80th time I've heard it in a way I'm like, oh my gosh, yes. Mm -hmm. Let me think about this. Let me enter into this. Let me meditate on this. I really think it's the posture, the tone that the leader is setting about the importance of the thing, that the liturgy that's being repeated. I think to, to com further comment on that, one of the things we're discovering as trying to build a community of artists is uh, one of the things we've kind of stumbled on is the importance of just setting a table. Um, you invite people to a table. Now, you can set a table a lot of different ways. You can have the person who assigns seats and puts people in that's a very manipulative kind of controlled environment, or you have a potluck. The, how you set a table um, is very biblical. Jesus invites us to a table all the time. And I think what the artist can do, depending on how, who is leading that and how it's being curated, is um, at that table, if you set that table with art, you, and, the, and, the, and the artists have set a table that allows your imagination to enter into the kingdom, then what we're doing is setting a table for people to have great conversations and to have great encounters. But we're not defining them. And I think that that's one of the greatest things we could do as the body of Christ is, is embrace a greater freedom for an undefined outcome. We, we like to really define this is, here's, the, here's how this, the service is going to go, here's how we're going to set the table, here's the desired outcome. And when we enter into that idea of mystery and, and awe and wonder, and we serve a God that, I want to serve a God that, that I, he's bigger than my definition. I, I, I want to I have new, fresh revelations from him. And so I think the, the opportunity for, for artists, especially for visual artists of all kinds, would be uh, to create opportunities for people to come to the table and have a, a fresh encounter that's not necessarily defined, but you're inviting them into the imagination to see the kingdom in a, with a diff, through a different lens. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'll get uh, an email or, or something from either of these guys, and my immediate response to my heart is, I love seeing life through your lens. You know, I mean, they have a particular, you all have a I wish I could read email like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you all have a particular lens that you see the kingdom through. And that's the importance of, of an artist. And that's what excites me about what's, I feel like another thing that's shifting in, in the worship world today, we call it the worship world, <laughs> is a return to the table, um, both in the sacrament, but also just like communing together and not just, <laughs> I was thinking a phrase the other day, just snacking on Jesus, you know? <laughs> like, or it's like we have a, taste, a tasteless snack once a quarter. Mm. Mm. You know, that comes yeah. in a little cup. And I get logistics and all that. I'm not dogging that. I kind of am, but um, <laughs> I'm just like, I, this is when Jesus would be like, bake some fresh bread. Put some rosemary in it. Make it all gluten-free so we don't have to, like, put a sign next to it. <laughs> God, come on. If that's, like, one thing you take away from today is, like, go back to your people who set up communion and be like, <laughs> just make it all gluten-free. Get aware of the sign. Just so we don't have to worry about it. Yeah, sorry. The one takeaway. The one takeaway from today is that. <laughs> so sorry. We're almost done. I promise. But, uh, but like feasting together and communing together and having conversations and, uh, and yes, letting letting the ancient practices and liturgy and new forms of worship and songs and art illuminate that space. But that's just what really excites me. Like. 
is the smaller spaces like this the little projection thing I did with that Sunday school room that I showed you this morning or uh, what he's doing with the gallery space and where you're there's creating intimate moments uh, to communion with each other um, you don't have to be the best, greatest artist in the world to, to make that happen that is really really simple um, and it's been happening since the disciples um, and I, I return to that or at least making space in our not that we have to get away from big church but um, I think creating space for that to happen is something that I miss these days. You had a question up there, um, yes. Yeah, I was just kind of curious when you guys were talking about setting the table and sort of um, creating a space or inviting people in to, to that. Um, I feel like the church sometimes focuses a lot on setting the table for the people in the church. And I feel like with you know digital media and with I mean, just art in general, there's such an ability to reach, you know, like you said, like the homeless people in Skid Row, or to really go outside of the church and set a table in a way that people, I think, instead of walking into a church and going to a traditional service, would be much more willing to kind of engage or you know come to dinner, I guess. So I was curious if you guys have any ideas of you know ways as artists to kind of um, maybe reach or set the table outside of the church, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, using digital media or Instagram or I don't know, you know, like different ways of... I have one answer. Um, we did this mission trip a long time ago in India where we just did like a short film festival where we invited everyone to come and um, we watched the short film, whether it was like some of them were two minutes, some of them were five minutes, I think there was one that was 20 minutes. And between each short film, uh, we would just talk with the person next to us about what we thought about the film. And there'd be like a series of questions. He's on a mission trip, so obviously we we're really geared towards like being able to share the gospel in the midst of that, you know. Obviously our, our perspective as Christians is always gonna be through the lens of Christ. And so it, just these conversations really easily turn towards what we believe and what our lives are all about. Um, that was a really cool thing, really easy to do, film festival in your community or in your church, but yeah, that was a, that was a really cool one. Um, I mentioned it earlier, but Mark Pearson's book, The Art of Curating Worship, really gets into that. And he talks about the three types of worship spaces that he's encountered. The traditional worship space, which is, it's for the church, it's like on a Sunday morning, big group setting or whatever. And he also talks about transitional, well, I would say next, on the other end of the spectrum, is um, what he calls guerrilla uh, worship spaces. Not like gorillas in a zoo or the jungle, but like G-U-E-R-R. -R, you know. So um, gorilla style, like um, uh, think of the phrase pop-up sacred space almost out in the community in parks and galleries, film festivals, all these different places where you can uh, curate space uh, in public. It's sacred spaces in public places is how, he's, how he defines it. And that can happen at night or any kind of time. Uh, it can happen in very, very simple, subtle ways that is kind of tacked on posts mm -hmm. and throughout the community, just little things that you could take or uh, whatever. Or it might be an entire space in a park where they pop up and create um, a way to let the entire community engage um, without pushing uh, Christianity on them or anything. And then the third place was uh, transitional worship spaces, which were in between. Transitional worship spaces might be like not on a Sunday, uh, not in a church building, but like a night of worship or a prayer, a curated prayer service where people can just kind of filter in and out. It's kind of a hybrid between the two. It's not, it's not, it's outside of the Sunday morning big church box but it's not just full on out in the community where anyone can show up. It's usually a scheduled time and space. But all I have to say is um, he has some great ideas and some stories in his book that I would recommend checking out. So. Biola University offers a variety of biblically centered degree programs ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.